Hello, I'm David Parley and I'm the convener of Rydell Writers. We meet monthly at the Arts Centre in Helmsley. And each month we give ourselves a subject or theme to spur us on to write something for the next month's meeting. And each year we give a public performance of our work in the studio bar at the Arts Centre. But now, of course, we can't do that. Nor can we meet together in the flesh. So instead, we're beginning to meet online. And now we are producing a series of little performances online. So welcome to our first offering. Some months ago, the theme we gave ourselves was upside down. I immediately thought of our daughter, who lives near Hobart in Tasmania, with her husband and our granddaughter. But Hobart, Tasmania is about as far from Helmsley, North Yorkshire, as you can get. Popping in to see each other is not an option. So already then, pre-Covid, we had to accept and adapt to a very real separation. Not an uncommon experience at any time, I know, but one that's been intensified by the Covid crisis. In fact, now locked down in York or even down the road may feel as far away as Hobart was and is. So I thought this poem would be as relevant now as it was when I wrote it. Not just about separation, but about being, in fact, deeply connected, physically and emotionally. It's called An Invitation. Every night there is a woman standing at the edge of the sea, feet just in the water, savouring the grains of sand as they cleanse her souls, watching the horizon, longing to accept the moon's invitation to swim down her silver path. And watching her tonight, I think she might, because many miles beneath her feet, she connects soul to sand-pricked soul with a girl at the edge of another sea, though in truth the same water, facing the morning sun and his invitation to swim down his golden path. And seeing her this day, I think she may. Well, at the very same meeting, I came up with a much shorter poem and quite different, called Upside Down. <laughs> I'd be loath to hang like a sloth upside down, my smile a frown. Well, thank you for listening. Now I'm going to hand you over to another of our Rydale writers, Sue Harris. At times like these we probably reflect that the people who do small things for us in our lives are the people that make a big difference and we remember them very much. And um, we, we know that we'll always remember our friends and we think about them fondly. But sometimes it's the people who do the little things for us um, that we miss very much when they're not around anymore. So this, this is all about a man I used to know. Now then, I've just come to have a cup of coffee with you, lass. So he would turn up unannounced at my back door and he and his dog would come in and settle at the kitchen table. At ease, he would reach into his pocket, slowly unpacking his tobacco and rolling a cigarette with practised yellowing fingers while the kettle boiled. 
We'd lived in the village for 15 years and were still regarded as newcomers. The story went that you had to fall in a beck before you could consider yourself a true villager, and I soon realised only children did that. Robin was the first real villager, rather than incomer, to have crossed my doorstep. And so, there he sat, ancient underpants rolled up over the top of grubby trousers, splendid in grey Victorian whiskers, regaling me with stories about the village and villagers past and present. One of them about a youth who fell up off ladder the other day. The children would burst in from school and look at me quizzically. This was a smoke and dog-free household, and yet here the old man sat, wreathed in smoke, watched by his adoring old dog, whose smell had by now pervaded the house. She struggled to get up to welcome them, and found that she was just tall enough to do a circuit of the room, licking all the kitchen surfaces. They fled. Robin had first come along, agile and fearless, to replace cracked pan tiles on the roof, somehow always sourcing old tiles which fitted and matched perfectly. Over time, though, he became less agile and wiser. He took to turning up at the end of winter, announcing that he'd come to Clerk Gutters. His bills were random, sometimes negligent, sometimes exorbitant, depending on need. On one such visit, Robin was waiting for me when I came home from work. He gestured at the doorstep. I'm coming back tomorrow to fix your step, he said. We can't have you living with that. I looked at the back door. I was so used to the step that I'd never noticed how narrow and unstable it was. The next day, I returned to find two solid steps, the width of paving stones. Henceforth, each exit from the house was to be a dramatic entrance onto the world's stage. Thank you very much. Do you have a bill for me? No, lass. I shall be back tomorrow to put you up a handrail. I don't need a handrail, Robin. You will. It was not long after that that I heard that Robin had died. We can't always tell who we will profoundly miss. I think of him in all my comings and goings. And now we go to David Smith. My first poem is called Altering the Clocks, 2020. After the essential ones, the kitchen, the bedroom, I normally dodge this job, but this year I seem to be more conscientious, hunting down the missing ones, like in the garden shed, which normally is allowed to dawdle for weeks. The spare wristwatch with the nail breaking winder, and even my old truck, which normally only sells, tells the correct time, half the time. It seems that nature is ignoring what is going on, bringing hope one hour nearer. This poem is about Lisbon, one of my favorite cities. That afternoon in Lisbon, when I was absolutely confident there was no action under that chrome sky, indolent air and sleeping dogs. I knew it was exactly the time to ask if you were languishing under that lazy fan, the faint breeze playing your legs through the slats. And could I come and join you? Ask you to put down your book, as there was absolutely nothing better to do. And finally, a poem called Cowboy Boots, a present from my friends in Texas. Cowboy Boots. Opening that surprise from Houston, tumbleweed memories came rolling towards me. The waft of horse, the taste of grits, the grip of rip-hard handshakes, boisterous bar stilts, branding me to promise that on return home, to walk down my street, 
thumbnails in my waistband and talk about 2,000 acre spreads. More cattle than you can count. Helicopter roundups. And yet all the time, her soft Comanche voice was lingering. It's such a shame our tracks will not cross again. That we cannot spread our blankets, share our air. I guess they always knew there would be a fork in our trails. <laughs>